I'm very happy to welcome this five panel here this morning. Thank you for being here. We have Terry and Tracy and Richard and Michael. And before we start, um, I will just do about a five minute introduction to type five. So now we're in the head triad. Um, we've done the body-based triad, eight, nine, and one, and we've done the heart-based triad, two, three, and four. Uh, now we're at the last triad of types, five, six, and seven. Uh, so today we'll be talking about these types that are based in, more in the head, more in the thinking function. This is, uh, these are types that tend to feel more at home in the intellect, at the cognitive level, these sometimes called mental types. Um, so as I've said before, we all have all three centers, uh, but when we come into personality, uh, personality is a way of focusing on a more narrow slice of reality as a way of surviving in the world. And um, the head types uh, feel most at home in the mental center, in the thinking activity. Um, just like the other two types felt more at home, either in the body-based center or the heart-based. Now, even saying feel more at home isn't really the right language, so I want to be more precise, because this is very much an automatic, unconscious uh, thing. Uh, and I know uh, oftentimes we're surprised, some of us, when, uh, when we figure out what center we're based in, because we may not feel completely at, uh, at, at, at home in that center. Uh, but But... Five, sixes, and sevens are based in the head center. And not only that, but they're also all connected in some way uh, to the core ego emotion of fear. So we can see each of these personality types as in some ways a, uh, a survival strategy related to coping with fear. Um, now, in once in personality, uh, this fear, the, the basis in fear of the shape of the personality is not always conscious. So it's really important to remember this. A lot of quote unquote fear types don't walk around feeling fearful. Some do, but some don't. Uh, in fact, sometimes we hear from types, uh, all three types, that they didn't really think of themselves as fearful per se before they learned the Enneagram. Uh, so five, six, and sevens all respond to this fear, this childhood fear, in a different way. Sixes uh, get vigilant and watchful, um, sort of look, searching the horizon for signs of danger. Um, sevens um, often don't experience uh, an active sense of being afraid, uh, but there's an unconscious move toward pleasant emotions, um, positive experiences, um, positive things to think about, stimulating interesting ideas as a way of unconsciously moving away from more unpleasant emotions, uh, some of which might be discomfort or even fear and anxiety. Uh, but again, oftentimes that's very unconscious. Um, with fives, Fives tend to, as one of my five friends put it, uh, get really good at avoiding situations in which they would feel fearful. Um, so they're very good at kind of proactively arranging their life in a way that they might uh, be more protected, uh, feel more safe, and not uh, get into territory that feels threatening. Uh, but again, that's, that op often operates unconsciously. Um, it's said that sixes have fears of being, sevens have fear of suffering, and fives have fear of feeling. So fives, uh, as part of their strategy, uh, coping strategy to get along in the world, and oftentimes fives had an early experience of either being neglected or intruded upon. Um, so much so that they needed to withdraw into themselves and kind of protect their inner territory and protect their inner resources, which can be thought of as energy, time, space, uh, things like this. Um, and so often fives describe either uh, not having enough uh, of their needs met, not having enough love, care, support, or being kind of intruded upon and people kind of invading their, their personal space to the point where they needed to withdraw. So with fives, the strategy is a bit like withdrawing into the mental and taking refuge in knowledge and knowing and figuring out things mentally, creating boundaries, 
And fives uh, automatically, unconsciously tend to detach from emotion uh, and move into a more mental space. Um, oftentimes, they don't recognize that this is happening, uh, but emotions can be threatening because uh, becoming emotionally involved with other people or having to deal with other people's emotions can feel to them as if it's draining their energy. And fives have a certain sense of scarcity about inner resources and personality, almost as if I only have so much, and so there is a fear of depletion a fear of being depleted by other people's needs, by other the demands that the outside world places on them. And so for this reason, they can tend to need a lot of private space, alone time, uh, boundaries, uh, and a certain level of safety so that they can uh, be assured that they won't be depleted. Um, one way that one person uh, said it to me one time was, that it was almost as if when he woke up in the morning, he, that he was aware of having a gas tank full of energy. Um, and throughout the day, um, he was aware of his, ener his tank kind of like the, the, the level of the tank kind of going down. Uh, and certain experiences would take more energy from him uh, and it would go down farther faster. Uh, and so there is this sort of neat sense of wanting to protect my internal resources or my energy. Uh, and sometimes fives get, uh, there, there are some misconceptions out there about fives uh, as if they don't have feelings or they aren't capable of being emotional because they can seem to be more mental and not very emotional. They don't, uh, my cousin who's a four who knows the Enneagram really well said fives are unruffleable you'll often not see them get upset in front of other people. Uh, and fives will say that they definitely are connected to their emotions. However, they, tend, they feel more comfortable feeling their emotions when they're by themselves. So what can be very challenging is having an emotion and being in the emotion with the person they're having it about, uh, having it about and sharing it with them in the moment. That can be very challenging. Uh, but it's not to say that they don't uh, go away and find a private space and get connected and feel their emotions. Uh, one example of this is I, my cousin's a five, and she said um, she she was an art history major, and in college she would go and see these amazing lectures, and they would show all this art, uh, and she would think it was fascinating. But then right after class, she would want to go home, go into her bedroom, close the door, lay on her bed, and feel all the emotions that she felt in relation to the art. So there is this sense of it's safer to feel, to be really connected to my heart when I'm by myself. Now, some fives may intellectualize and they may think they're having feelings when they're just thinking about feelings. Uh, so that can be important to notice uh, if you're a five, to be aware and self-observing, like am I actually in the emotion or am I thinking about having it and maybe making the mistake of thinking I'm actually having the emotion. But again, that's part of the inner work of the five. Now, another thing to know about fives is that because they can seem quiet or, or not as emotional, we can uh, project onto them. Uh, sometimes uh, people uh, see fives as being aloof or even arrogant, uh, but this is often a defense because sometimes fives feel a bit of social awkwardness and they take refuge in, in, in they, they tend to feel more comfortable with information and data and knowledge. Uh, and so sometimes they can seem aloof, uh, and then of course we, be, or, or insensitive, because we're not seeing them express uh, uh, emotions, or sometimes they don't feel comfortable sharing a lot of personal detail about themselves, especially early on. They can be one of the more introverted types. But it's really important to remember that fives are very sensitive. And that's why they need more personal space is because they're hypersensitive. Uh, they, it's, it's as if, I've heard it, uh, you know, it's as if they're, um, they don't have a lot of natural protection. And so because of that, they need more space and they need to protect themselves. And that's actually wise uh, to be able to, to, to take the space that they need in order to feel okay in a relationship. I think that's, I'll stop there for now to stop with that introduction and turn it over now to the experts, the real experts in type five. Uh, and so um, let's start with Terry, if you don't mind. And um, if you can just tell us a little bit about how you've recognized yourself as a five, what, how you see some of these five 
uh, traits that I've discussed or even other ones, how, how you see that showing up for you? Um, uh, when I was 19, I went to Esalen. I was taking t some time off from school. Uh, I spent a month there, and um, one of my friends that I made there, she was talking about the Enneagram, and so I went to the bookstore there, and I got the book, a book, um, but I never read it, um, or not much of it, but I knew there were nine types. And, uh, and then about five years later, I went to Spain to um, learn Spanish, so I went to language school there, and I was, you know, I made I made some, uh, you know, some friends who were also there, just traveling or studying. And um, there was one guy, and uh, he was pretty easy to get along with, and you know, he was polite, he was pretty knowledgeable. We could talk about different topics. He was easy to get along with. Um, he was a little flat emotionally. A little boring. Um, <laughs> you know, not a great guy to go to a party with, but um, we got along fine. And then I I kind of um, didn't really want to hang out with him that much anymore. And I don't know if I felt, experienced this at the time or later, but I, I realized that he was, he was kind of just like me. <laughs> and, and he even had the same name. He, it was, um, he was from France, it was Thierry. <laughs> Excuse my French accent. Um, in any case, I, I actually, for other reasons, I don't have time to go into all the details, I decided to go to Barcelona for the rest of my trip and find a, another school there. Um, I don't know, I, I do that, I have kind of a pattern of just like leaving or starting over or... Uh, taking time off. So, um, and then about, this is maybe 18 years later, I did a, again, no studying of the Enneagram during any of these decades. Um, I did a workshop with Claudio Naranjo, which is how I met B. Um, and we've done a couple more workshops together. And, I guess right before the workshop, uh, someone, a therapist at the time, said, oh, maybe you're a four, but she was open, she was, um, she it, it told me she wasn't that familiar with the Enneagram anymore. It had been about 40 years since she had worked with Claudio, so she said, you know, it's just a suggestion. Um, so at, at the workshop, um, I sort of explored the, the, the group of fours. They, they just said no. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so that was, that didn't last very long. So <laughs> learning about the different nine types, I thought they were all really, um, you know, interesting. And I was really curious about each one. When I got to, when we got to five, um, it was a really different experience. I, I was really experiencing a lot of, um, and again, I'm still trying to figure out what my type is. I really had an experience of like aversion or distaste or uh, I didn't like any of the personality traits. That It was all, the whole character was very unattractive to me. Which um, often happens when we find our right type, right? <laughs> um, and uh, by the it was about a nine day workshop, and by the end, I I finally I was you know I accepted it because it was <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty obvious, and um, <laughs> and it was it was it was kind of like when I was in Spain twenty uh, you know eighteen years earlier. It was kind of that. It was kind of like that, where you're sort of looking in the mirror, and and it's kind of hard to to accept it. Um, except this was a lot uh, more. This was a lot more serious, I guess. I, you know, I couldn't just leave. I couldn't just go on a train to Barcelona. <laughs> I, I, um, 
this was just so much bigger. It was just, it wasn't just, and it wasn't just my, my personality. It was like my whole life, my whole family, you know, previous generations, you know, everything. And it was, um, it wasn't, I, and I might, Michael earlier had used the phrase, this is awesome, you know, in reference to kind of figuring out your type. That's not what it felt like for me. It was very, very difficult. And, um, what do you think was difficult about owning your type as five? I don't know. I, um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to put into words, but mm-hmm. um, just, uh, I, I don't know, just seeing how kind of big the whole thing was. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, Claudio has quoted somebody, I don't remember who, the, who he was quoting, but it was, the, the quote was, the, the truth kills us. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of like I was just starting to experience mm-hmm. that, and and that was almost five years ago, exactly. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like that, something like that. Facing the truth in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of courage, by the way, I think, to accept that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like you said, even especially since you're saying, you said mm-hmm. that you had kind of a sense of this guy that you met in Europe is not really... He wasn't really someone you were attracted to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do you see how do you see your five um, kind of showing up in your life right now? How do you uh, how do you relate to it now that you've had time um, to know it more? I mean, everything. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know where. I don't. I don't want to. Do you relate to I, being sort of more mental than emotional? Oh, definitely. I, I don't have, I don't really experience feelings very often. Um, and then even just being in my body, that's, I have less access to that than, than being in my head. Um, but anyways, to answer your question, I think the biggest struggle is, is with relationships and, and just social interactions. Um, this is kind of from a long time ago, but I'll just mm-hmm. mention it. One of my best friends is actually his birthday today. Um, that was just to remind myself to call him later. But <laughs> <clears throat> so he likes to tell the story, and usually when he tells a story, it's because he wants to make people laugh. But he, this one's not not funny. But so about almost twenty years ago, I was visiting San Francisco. I was visiting him and another guy. So we're in our mid 20s and we decided to go out to a movie so we went to the AMC Kabuki Theater in Japantown and so we're wait there's kind of a long line it's like a friday night or saturday night and there were these two women in front of us who were attractive my friend he starts talking to them because uh, you know i it wasn't me he was he did it um, i was i'm too shy to try something like that and so we're kind of, and the other guy was, was kind of um, good at that too. So we're starting to get to know these women in, in line. And then at some point, for some reason, I decided, well, I better go to the front and just see what's going on. Um, and I knew they were going to see a different movie from the one we were going to see. And so I, when I went to the front, I found out that their movie was sold out. And so I come back and I, I tell the two women, I, that their movie sold out. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what exactly I did, whether the some something about the way I said it or the expression on my face or something. But apparently the way, according to my friend's version of the story, they, uh, I mean, it, it pretty much ended whatever was going on in our... <laughs> Put a damper on things? <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Um, apparently, apparently they thought I was taking pleasure in their misfortune or something like that, which, of course, I wasn't. I, th- I thought I was helping. I, I thought, well, of course, I have to tell them so that um, 
they can go to plan B, which they probably don't even have, so they need time to think about. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so, but they, apparently, they reacted to me like I was just, like, cruel and unusual mm-hmm. or, or something. like. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I sort of had, like, a nervous smile or, or something. I mean, I'm sure I felt a little awkward because meeting women like that in, in a, you know, that, that's not like fun or easy. So I don't, I don't know. But mm-hmm. the way my friend tells the story, he, he thinks it's very like illuminating or important. Mm-hmm. Um, just as a, uh, an exam- just in terms of my personality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Instinct. Anything else before you before we move on? And we'll we'll talk about instinct at some point. Yeah. Um. No, we, can, we should move on. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll come back to you. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> okay, Tracy. So, how do you relate to one, and how did you find yourself in it, and how do you see it showing up in your life? Um. So. I started um, learning about the Enneagram about 10 years ago, and I was in graduate school, actually, and went to a, actually, Dave Warner is here, (laughs) and uh, there was a workshop, and a few of us went to the workshop, and I um, went with a friend who's a two, and I thought, well, I'm a two. I want to, you know, make sure everybody's taken care of and all of that, and so um, about probably 10 minutes into um, the workshop, I realized I was not a two, (laughs) Uh, but stayed there. And um, and then, oh, oh, I guess it was maybe six months later, we had um, an event um, as part of our program where we brought in an Enneagram teacher and she very clearly, one of those very famous people, Enneagram people, (laughs) uh, said I was a one and described me and said, this is what you're doing and this is why you are a one. And I thought, no, that's not me. And I got very defensive. And um, so anyway, that was an experience there where I guess the, um, what that was, what maybe was how I was being identified as a one is I wanted to make sure that um, every I was actually setting up the workshop, and so I wanted to make sure that all the information was available to everybody. I I was treating everybody like I would want to be treated, mm-hmm. and so what that meant to me is that um, the facilitator would walk in and all of the equipment would be set up correctly. Um, I would be seen as very competent because everything went smoothly. Everybody had uh, the comforts that they needed to be fully present at the at the workshop. So, to me, that was um, may, maybe outwardly it looked like one type. Mm-hmm. Um, it was all about me and being me being seen as competent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and around that time, I started definitely identifying with a five. And as soon as I started reading about that and, and identifying with it, it, I was at home. It felt very comfortable, mm. um, and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it for, I, for whatever reasons. And I don't know if that was just that I always felt a little outside, like the outsider, mm. or I never quite understood what people's reactions were to me because I have been identified as very aloof um, and disconnected or unemotional. Uh, I hear that from some fives um, who say that they were actually relieved when they met the Enneagram and and typed themselves as a five because, like, I remember one woman on a panel said that her husband was always saying, what's wrong with you that you don't want to go to parties and you don't want to socialize or something wrong with you? Mm-hmm. And so when she said when she found out she was a five, she was like, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just a five. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost like it, it kind of makes sense yeah. in a certain way. And it's sort of like a relief, like, oh, okay. I may not want to interact in the same way others do, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and then I think uh, how I would have just how I kind of described myself because I've done um, other panels earlier on uh, in my learning about the Enneagram and the way I would describe um, how I operated was that I have these compartments and I have information in all of the compartments and if there's uh, something that was very emotional for me, traumatic, I figure it out, I you know, deal with it on my own, and it's in that compartment. And then when I'm uh, in a group, I can pull it out of the, all the emotion is taken out of it, and the feelings are taken out of it, so I can talk about it all day long. And to me, it felt like I'm, I'm talking about my feelings, but it, it was the idea behind it, not necessarily the, the emotion. Mm-hmm. And I think the the work that I've been doing the past couple years, um, I can say that those compartments are kind of exploding and they're it, they're intermingling, um, which feels a little scary, but um, but very rewarding. You know, I've I've um, I feel like I I feel I can feel. I feel things in the moment. I can uh, connect with people in that feeling uh, without having to retreat. Uh, sometimes it's very uncomfortable, um, but I think I've probably found mm-hmm. very safe spaces to be able to do that. Um, and so it's it's almost like a practice where I've found that I can um, do that more even outside of those comfort zones. and have more meaningful conversations with people in the moment versus having to retreat um, and figure it out and then, and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes when that happens, I'll retreat and I'll think, Oh, this is all of these great thoughts, but it, the moments passed. And so if Mm -hmm. I would go back and talk with that person, they'd be looking at me like, what, you know, Mm -hmm. what are you talking about? (laughs) So, so it's much, it's much better to be able to, express my feelings in the moment, talk Mm -hmm. about them um, at the time that that they're actually happening. And so it sounds like that's the, you've been able to do that to grow, but it sounds like what's what's most comfortable is to be able to go away and kind of process on your own. Yes. My, My teaching partner is a five, and what he often says is, if you have something important to say to a five, say it and then go away. <laughs> leave. leave. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you one more thing, and that is, you mentioned these compartments, and it is said that fives compartmentalize. Um, and and again, it sounds like, I liked that you talked about how you're doing the work of getting rid of the compartments, but can you tell us what the purpose of the compartments are, or the compartmentalization that you do? How does that work, and and why, why, why is that uh, uh, something that feels good? Yeah. Uh, you know what, for me, when I say that, and I think it, it's kind of lost its um, um, clarity because it, it was quite a while ago, but the, it was very um, vivid, the, these compartments. It was almost like um, uh, going to the library and ha- the um, what, the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so you'd have the, the car, the, you know, the little compartments and the cards. Um to find the books. And so I think that uh, the compartmentalizing um, part of that is... uh, Is it people that are compartmentalized or experiences? Yeah, maybe it's the, so it's it's having the, it's it's everything that is in an experience, but dissecting it uh, so that I can separate the feelings out Mm -hmm. so that I'm... Um, then I can kind of take it out and look at it at a later time mm-hmm. and look at all at it at all angles and really analyze. I guess it's kind of an analytical tool for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds like there's something that feels good about sort of separating things off from each other. Yes, and and I would say even just you suggesting the people. I have compartments of people, so there are people that I go do certain things with that. Um, I can be in that group at that moment. And there's a lot, I don't know if this is, this is just very true for me that there's so, so much gray area. And um, so I, I feel like, and sometimes that, I don't know if that's kind of nine-like where you're kind of can adapt to the, um, 
the environment that you're in or um, maybe, maybe that's not true. Um, I'm kind of getting lost there. Uh, um, I would say just, I mean, just kind of coming back to that question is probably mostly it's to set, to, to, to extract the feeling, mm -hmm. um, to be able to put that over in one place so then I can just deal with what's going on in front of me and then I can come back to the feeling later. It's almost it's, like file folders and feelings get yeah. separated out, but things get, you can kind of analyze that as its own thing, but it doesn't necessarily get mixed up with other people. Yeah. I have a five friend who said that it's her biggest nightmare to have a party where all the friends from different areas of her life would be there. Mm -hmm. She kind of wants to relate to each of her friends in their different categories and their different contexts, but bringing them together would sound terrible to yeah, her. Yeah, a little too messy. Messy, yeah. 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 Or confu yeah. confused, Confused, or they might share information about you behind that they, that mm -hmm. they're not, that and not stay in their compartments. Yeah. <laughs> and I think also there's something about the compartments where I, I like to go back and visit an experience. Mm. And so it's there. And then I, you know, it's almost like I have a new lens. Oh, sorry. It's like I have a new lens every time I kind of go back and say, oh, now what is, what does this look like for me now today? Right. Versus how, how it was when it, when it actually happened. Right. Okay. It's a, a, a pretty, um, Intricate filing system. Intricate filing system. <laughs> yes, mental files. So, I guess so, yeah. That's great. All right, thank you. Okay, so Richard, can you tell us a little bit about how you have found yourself as a five and what these five traits uh, look like in your life? Um, sure. So I started studying in the early 90s and uh, I originally typed myself as a seven because back then in the 90s, you probably remember, they didn't really expand the five vision very much. It was, it was pretty withdrawn and pretty quiet and uh, seven seemed to fit, but it also kind of was painful for me to kind of stay in the seven and let's go party. And I wasn't really into let's go party. So it was, it was a challenge. And when I finally found the five, after someone pointed out that I love doing 10-day silent retreats and I love doing things by myself, and they said, maybe five is more what you are. And I thought, that's it. That's, that makes so much more sense. Mm -hmm. But I didn't feel like, again, the textbook five. And mm -hmm. so that was a little, a, a little of a challenge, but uh, it was a relief. And so I studied it. I love the categorization we were talking about uh, how you can actually say, oh, this is what's going on with someone else. Mm -hmm. Because with a five, it's like, are they insane? What are they doing this for? <laughs> Why are they reacting in this feelings or these, you know, hostilities or, you know, whatever that kind of clenches us? It always struck me as why is half or at least half the world insane and I'm picking up on mm -hmm. all these vibrations? So suddenly it's... I can just kind of categorize, even if I'm not right about what their type is, I can categorize and say, maybe they're acting like an eight. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. And, mm -hmm. and I have three kids and suddenly it was like, oh, maybe they're just behaving like a two would behave here. And I didn't type anybody. I just use that to relax. To have the sense of other people are coming from whole different yeah, places different and are more emotional. Mm -hmm. And I could just kind of open and say, oh, I'll let them do mm. their type. And so for me, it was a, categori a categorizing, but it wasn't using it as an excuse mm -hmm. and it wasn't kind of putting them in a box. It was just letting me relax. So right. for a five in some ways, knowing your Enneagram type and knowing others have that different perspective is really, really a helpful thing. Um, one thing Terry mentioned was the fact about being boring. So that one kind of hit when you said that. Because I've had people tell me that too, you know, kind of boring. <laughs> and it's just amazing to me. Did it? Was it hard for you to understand that? For me, it was like, you don't have any idea what's going on exactly. in here. Exactly. <laughs> there is never boring. Exactly. You know? Yeah, still water is deep. Yes. Yeah, I look at the books on the shelf, and I'm just kind of, <laughs> wow. And then I see the screen with the yes. curtain. I look at the tape on the, you know, I'm just seeing all kinds of things. And 
there's stuff going on in here. You have no idea. Yes. But what's coming out or what's coming across is, yeah, this guy's kind of boring. Right. Know? So there may be a lot going, this is really important for us to know, a lot going on oh, in here, yeah. right? But that doesn't mean you bring it out here, right? Right. And I don't feel bored ever with uh -huh. anybody. I right. look at somebody and I go, wow, there's so many signals and things picking up and what they're wearing and what what they're saying. And it's like, wow, I, you know, I could never be bored. Right. Which is kind of a nice thing because I'd ask people, could you describe what boring is? <laughs> and I thought, well, that's yeah. just fear. You know, you're just afraid. Or I didn't yes. get it. I still don't get it. I yes. don't understand boring at yes. all because... You're just throwing out so many signs and signals. I don't. And, and here's, I don't have time for boredom. Here's the way my five business partner says it. So he does this demonstration when we even just talk about how head types work. You know, because some of the rest of us who aren't head types may not understand what it's like to be inside of a head type. And he does this demonstration where he finds another head type in the room and that he says, let's have just a two minute conversation. And then he asks the person in that two minute conversation. Tell us all the thoughts that you had. And that person will go like 29, 50 thoughts that they had just in this two minute conversation. And he'll say, like when B says something to me, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about that and I'm remembering mm -hmm. this and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking, oh, I need to do that tomorrow. And, and then I'm thinking like, he never listens to me. Uh, <laughs> but really it's just that he has so many mental associations that are going on all the time. And I think for fives, it's really, it's like that, especially because they're interested in so many different things on an intellectual level. Yeah, and it's problematic, and it can kind of take you on diversions where you probably don't need to be on those diversions. But uh, um, I got into kind of more of the meditative type stuff, and that's helpful because I'll be kind of deeply quieting, and then some thoughts will kind of rise, and it'll take me on these little journeys. And, you know, they're wonderful journeys, but to know that I'm, well, right now I'm kind of into the more meditative, let's bring it back, maybe I can think about that later. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that's where the withdrawal happens for a five, is that you don't have enough energy to process everything without kind of holding some energy for withdrawing and for kind of chugging through mentally what you need to. So. An idea to chug through, to kind of get to the research, to get to the bottom of something, to the source, it takes energy. Mm -hmm. And so the withdrawal is not for me running from feeling. Mm -hmm. It's not running from fear. It's like I need the energy to find out and know this. And that's mm -hmm. where this inner drive to know is all about. I need to know. And mm -hmm. I had a spiritual teacher say, Richard, maybe you don't need to know. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, what? Yes. <laughs> and inside it's like I'm fighting, saying, I have to know. <laughs> now you're now you identify as a social five, is that right? Yeah, I'm a social five. So social fives also that would also explain why you thought you were a seven at first, because social fives look a bit like sevens. Yeah. And we'll find out later today what that looks like. And um and it also sounds, and, and social fives are also very focused on knowing things and oh, yeah. knowing a lot of different things. And it can be very hard for them to either admit they don't know something or, like, you're, like you just said, think that not knowing is an option. <laughs> yeah, and what a place. This land of not knowing is, is truly a remarkable place where you can kind of suddenly, I don't have to know. Mm. And I can recognize that there's an... Uh, it's like an internal knowing is happening all the time without my necessarily contributing to it. Mm -hmm. And that is a wonderful place to be because mm -hmm. suddenly I don't have to take responsibility to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't need that. Oh, yeah, he doesn't need it. So you can hold on to that, yeah. So, Michael, well, what does this look like for you, this five territory? Well, it's so fascinating. It's the first time I've ever been on a panel with other fives, and both the similarities and the differences are, are acute for me. Um, I have a little cartoon uh, over the, in, in, in our bathroom, that little kind of figure that says, uh, I like the time just before dawn when there's nobody there to tell me who I am, 
so I can experience who I actually am, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I've, I've mentioned that I looked at Enneagram for probably at least 30 years and it didn't make any sense to me. And then all of a sudden it opened up and I can't even put a date on it. But I know it wasn't with a person, it was with a book. You know? <laughs> yes. um, I love the quote from Claudio Naranjo about fives would uh, rather read than live. <laughs> and, um, mm. and, you know, I, I think both my parents were fives. My father came from a line of uh, Russian Jewish rabbinic scholars, and he, he became a secular professor, but he was still essentially a rabbi. And my mother <clears throat> came from Irish, uh, Irish uh, Scottish, German uh, healers and doers. You know, they, they built things and, they, and, and her father was a surgeon and she's a psychologist. So I grew up with this combination of my mother's heart and my father's mind and my mother's doing stuff. So it says that fives often have difficulty making the transition from thought to action. But that's not true for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I attribute that to uh, my experience of the power of going to eight internally. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it's said that if you're somewhat more evolved five, that you pick up the high side of eight. So I don't pick up the anger of eight, but um, I have always uh, started things, you know, started um, a preschool, started Full Circle, which was a school for troubled kids, started Commonweal, started, and within Commonweal, I keep starting things and then find great people to run them. So it's a form of social entrepreneurship um, that, but that's the doing side. But then I need to retreat into quiet and silence and be with my wife, Cheryl, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and be at home or be in my study. And, and when people contact me and they say, can we get together? My response, because they usually contact me by email, my response will be, could we do this by email? <laughs> and if we can't do it by email, could we do it by phone? Mm -hmm. And if we can't do it by mm -hmm. phone, then I'll get together, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and partly it's an efficiency thing because, you know, there are a lot of things to do. And, or if they ask for a meeting, I'll say, could you tell me what it's about? You know, so I, um, so, and um, when... Um, I, want, I want to say one thing before yeah. you move on, another example. So my business partner, sometimes he says the same thing. Yeah. He, he likes text the most yeah. and then like, phone and then video conference and right. then in person. Right. And sometimes what he'll do when we're working together is we'll be together and he'll say, I really want to go be in my room by myself now. Is that okay? And I say, okay. Mm. So he leaves and as soon as he's gone, he starts texting me. <laughs> and so it's so funny that he now he's texting me for an hour and we were just together. So it's so interesting that there is something that feels so good to him to being in his room by himself, even though he's still interested in interacting, he just would rather do it over text. And one time he did a very funny thing in that we were having lunch during a retreat and he went to the bathroom and he started texting me from the bathroom. And it's like, really? <laughs> but that's, yes. So I just wanted to highlight that, right. that comment. <laughs> yes. What else? So when Terry said uh, that he, he didn't like being a five, but he couldn't leave, right? <laughs> um, and then Tracy said, she liked it, uh, and um, so I'm, I'm of the like it school, um, and there, somewhere in your book or somewhere I read that fives actually have more difficulty than other types getting out of the type because many of them think, what's not to like about it? Yes, you know? yes. Uh, and I have that experience. It's like 
this is just fine with me. And so, yes, uh, yes. What's the problem here? What's the problem here? <laughs> so, um, yes. And I think, you know, in, in relationship to groups, um, sort of the, the going to seven piece. So if I have a purpose in a group, I am just fine. So mm-hmm. example, at Commonweal, you know, being here with this group, I am totally fine because I have a purpose being here. I'm enjoying it. I, um, I will need to be quiet afterward, but I'm in a But if, uh, if somebody suggests that we go to a cocktail party or a gathering where I don't have a purpose, I really don't want to go, you know. Uh, so, and then if I'm in a gathering where I have a purpose, if I'm participating in some way in leadership, I'm totally fine. I'm also totally fine if I'm not participating in leadership, but if I'm not participating in leadership, I want to be at the edge. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be in the middle of the gathering. I want to be at the very edge of the gathering. So it's either participate at the center, be at the edge. I really don't care which one it is, mm-hmm. but I don't want to be <clears throat> in the middle of it. And why is that? Why do you think that's... Because um, I'm not comfortable in groups of people unless I have a purpose, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But once I have a purpose, mm-hmm. I'm fierce about it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, mm-hmm. And then being on the edge, it's like you can be there, but not completely exactly. in the middle of things. Exactly. And I can multitask, you know. Mm-hmm. So I can, um, like, be at the edge of a conference and be checking my email or checking the news or, you know doing something else. Partly in your own world or in your own space. In my own space. And, you know, when I came out, left teaching at Yale on sabbatical and came out here, I was going, you know, I was on a tenure track at Yale. I was going from the center to the very edge of the country. I mean, in 1972, when I came out, um... Bolinas was isolated. There were no faxes, there were no email, there, you know, none of that stuff. And it was a super isolated place. Mm-hmm. But in starting Commonweal as a place to heal ourselves and heal the earth, there was this action orientation. So on the one hand, I was isolated at the very edge of the country. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, and healing ourselves and healing the earth, Somebody once described Commonweal, a great description, as a think-and-do tank for social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So there's the thought dimension, but then there's the do dimension. Mm -hmm. And so it's praxis. And so it's a process of learning, not only from books, but from the experience of doing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that second kind of learning, of praxis, you know, I'll start a project. When I start a project, I, my, my main thing is I don't want anybody to be able to stop me. Mm-hmm. That's the core. And so in order to do it in a way that nobody can stop me, mm-hmm. it has to be done for no money because that's the ah. only way somebody can stop me. Ah. Right? And so I start things with no money, uh, and then I learn from them. It's like I have the idea, but it will teach me what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. And if my first ideas about it don't turn out, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, It will show me what it wants to be Mm -hmm. in this process of praxis. And so it sounds like there's a lot of learning in your doing, in your version of doing, right? So for other types who might also do, It may not be about learning as much as it is for you, it sounds like. And the superpower of detachment Mm. is enormously (coughs) valuable to me because, you know, I've spent 33 years co-leading 205 retreats for people with cancer. (coughs) And a lot of time working on intractable problems of, you know, civilizational collapse or juvenile justice or whatever it is. So there's a way in which... I can be in the middle of these issues, uh, but not carrying them. You know, Angela Sarian had these four rules for spiritual life. Show up, pay attention, tell the truth, and don't be attached to the outcome. Yeah. 
Warren Slosberg, when he'd been working with me for a few years, our executive director, he looked at me and said, I notice you don't stress much. Mm -hmm. And it's true, I just do it. <clears throat> 95% of what happens at Commonwealth just rolls off my back. It's like, we're doing it, we're doing our best, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't work, so be it. Let's mm -hmm. learn from, let's embrace error, let's learn mm -hmm. from it so that we don't make the same mistakes again. Right, and it is all about the learning. And yes. I, I, you also relate to Social 5, is that right? Or, I, I relate, not sure. and we've talked about this, both yes. social and one-to-one. -one. Right. And I've wondered about which one I truly am, because the one-to-one, -one, I am at my best one-to-one, -one, or, or you know, in front of a group. But mm -hmm. not in the middle of a group. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm really at my best, I think, one to one. Mm -hmm. And so, in the cancer help program, I do one to one sessions with people. Mm -hmm. um, but my experience is that externally, I'm a social thought. Mm -hmm. But that the generative power comes from the power of love, mm -hmm. and that my wife Charlotte and I have been married for 35 years, and. I need to go home and be with Cheryl in mm -hmm. quiet. And, and I also, <clears throat> my mother and father truly loved all three of us. And mm -hmm. I'm that freak of nature that had a happy, loving mm -hmm. childhood. Mm -hmm. And so um, my experience is that my life is based in love mm -hmm. and that that's the generative power but it expresses as a social five. Mm -hmm. So to this day, mm -hmm. I don't, and I like mm -hmm. the fact that you don't see it as a stack. When you s mm -hmm. spoke of it as sequencing, mm -hmm. uh, that made a whole lot of sense to me because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a sequencing thing for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I will highlight that, that what you talk about being a leader and also the getting really immersed in a social cause and sort of doing mm -hmm. sounds very much that might be the social five piece. Mm -hmm. uh, social fives can get very active and very out there, mm -hmm. you know? And that's why sometimes people will say, are you sure, like my, my um, teaching partner is a social five mm -hmm. and he's a very good leader, he's very good on stage and people will say, are you sure? They, they think he's a three and not a five, but he's definitely a five. Um, and so I think that also the passionate commitment to sort of doing something in the world, but also seeing the doing is learning, always learning. It's all, everything always involves learning. That's, those, those are just things I'll highlight as social five as well. Okay. Okay. Do, do you guys want to talk a little bit about your s subtype? Because I know uh, we talked a little bit about social five, and I do also think that there's a, you, you, like you're saying, you relate to one-to-one -one five, but which, what, what subtypes do you relate to, and can you say a little bit about how that is for you? Yeah, I um, am a self-pres, um, and then I think socially repressed. Um, and I have a different experience with the detachment part. I... Um, and I don't know if this has anything to do with this. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, that's... But just the, the idea when you were describing that, I... Um, my whole thing is about competence. And so if, mm -hmm. if something that I'm driving or that I've initiated is not successful, it's really difficult for me. Mm -hmm. and, I t and it's all personal and I, and I take the full responsibility and the full burden of the failure. Um, and uh, so, so that's, uh, maybe that's the difference between mm -hmm. the... Right, being the more self-preservation. Yeah. There may be something um, that's sort of self-sustaining about needing to appear competent. Yes. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of a self press 5 friend of mine who um, a lot of people remark at how social she is and how outgoing. And she says what she's learned to do is she watches other people and how they're social, and it's almost a little bit like camouflage, like wearing the right thing, acting in the right ways. It's all, she's a self-preservation five. It's all so people won't question her boundaries. Mm -hmm. 
It's all so she looks right and she's competent and she's uh, both socially and in work life so that people don't see behind the mask and they don't sort of penetrate her barrier uh, in a way. And and which was really interesting to me because she and because socially she really she has a limit. You know, like I need to know the time limit. She's a math teacher and people will say like, wow, you're a high school math teacher. That's an interesting occupation for a five. She goes, well, it's great because I really enjoy my students and teaching and learning. But then at a certain time, the bell rings every day and everyone leaves. And that's the part she likes the best about it. Clear boundaries. Um, and then it's it's over. Are boundaries important to you? Yes. The Actually, I have a friend staying with me for the past week and she was considering coming today um, because she's got a friend in Bolinas, kind of an odd timing. But um, yesterday morning, I said to her, you can go, but I'm going exactly where I'm headed and I'm not taking any detour. So (laughs) if your friend is along the way, I'll let you off. But uh, otherwise... You know, you're not going. <laughs> so, I'm not going out and, of my and way. And then yeah. later I thought, oh, is that a little harsh? But I, I just felt like, I'm. you know, that's sort of what I do. It's and clear. Yeah, yeah. And even the, um, leave, you know, leaving at, at the end, I'm done. Um, the social part of these kind of things is, is sometimes difficult. I like to um, go off kind of on my own. Um, and interesting about the... Um, e- Social events, I love to organize, and I can put on an incredible event. I uh, plan our family reunions and all of those kind of things, work-related things. I'm, I'm definitely a planner. I have really good ideas, but I'm planning it, and then I'm not interested in participating. So there's all these great activities going on, my family reunions, everybody's there. I make sure everybody's having a good time, and then I'm kind of on the sideline because mm-hmm. uh, my work is done, right? right? And it all mm-hmm. so and probably the better you plan it, exactly, yes. the more you can stay out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Beautiful. Thank you, <laughs> Terry. Which Which of these do you relate to subtype wise, and uh, and what does that look like for uh, you? Self preservation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And are boundaries important for you, or how do you negotiate boundaries with people? And, is it, is it hard or easy to share personal information about yourself? Uh, I, I don't know. I, um, yeah, I guess I would say boundaries are important in terms of being pretty protective of my space or my energy and all of that. Um, but I also I have a lot of difficulty with boundaries. Mm. Um, like maybe f- experience, feeling like um, you know, someone has violated my boundary, even though they really haven't. Mm. That, that, and then I do this, and the, and then maybe me doing that to someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's that's a hard. That's kind of a bigger question. Um, like mm-hmm. something might happen at work where someone's supposed to help me, and then they they make a mistake and. And I get really irritated as if someone has, like, really gotten into my space and is, like, interfering with what I'm, mm. what I'm trying to do, which is very important right now. Even though it was probably kind of harmless and I could have just brushed it off and kept going. But it, it just felt, like, almost physical, mm. the, uh, the intrusion or the, the interference. It, right. I've heard five say, especially my self-preservation five friend, that she needs to have control over her domain. Is it like that for you at work? Very much, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and you work in a hospital, is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have an example about how that, how things might play out at work in terms of being a five? I, I yeah. I mean, like sometimes. Um, um, Trying to think of one. Um, well, it could be something. This is kind of minor, but sometimes there's a guy who sits next to me, not in the hospital, but in clinic, a couple cubicles down, and he he speaks in a really loud voice, for much louder than you need for people to hear you. <laughs> and he has a deep voice. And then if he has a student with him, 
for a resident that day, then he's going to be talking a lot more because he's like teaching. <coughs> and it's just way too loud. And so I, I have earplugs for that. And I only and I pull them out only, the only time I ever use them is with, because of him. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm pretty sensitive to sound, light, uh, temperature, um, just anything that affects my energy or my body, my uh, anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess a more another example would be if I'm in the operating room and somebody um, I don't know, like if someone is not it causes a distraction or makes kind of a mistake um, and I don't know. I, I get angry, mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I. Um, do you express the anger, or just feel it inside? Um, no, I you I do end up expressing it, mm-hmm. um, and I'm more. You know, this is a problem. You know, people don't like it when mm-hmm. you're not nice at work. Obviously, <laughs> um, people want mm-hmm. work to be like like fun and. You know, talking about the, the weather, like the kids are like, oh, like how's the smoke? You know, when all the around Thanksgiving or just whatever. And and I'm pretty focused at work, and so yeah, I get impatient, and I can be pretty harsh in um, trying to, to correct the situation, mm-hmm. which I'm working on because it's not very effective usually. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it could be just. People are, um, I don't know, somehow it, it, I, it's, it's such a violation of, I, I don't know, I take it so personally or something, mm-hmm. and um, like it's interfering with what I have, what I need to do right now, mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, um, my friend who's a self pres 5 says she doesn't like surprises. I don't like them at all. I even, uh, another... Uh, I don't know if these examples are dumb or anything, but so <laughs> last week I was going to be in the operating room. This OR tech who I have a really good relationship with, she texted me the day before and she said, you're going to be in room one, not two. 99% of the room, 99% of the time I'm in room two, which is kind of small. Room one's really small, which bothers me because I'm very sensitive to like space. Um, you know, my apartments always have high ceilings. <laughs> I, I just want, so anyways, and then the next day, and it actually, it sounds, I actually really appreciated that I was able to find that out the day before, not mm-hmm. 10 minutes before, right. not at 7.15 in the morning, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise that would have affected like my whole like visualization the day before mm-hmm. of what I was going to do because it was going to be in a different room. So that's not what I would want to do. Um, and it just, and it, I'm telling you, this is a minor thing. It's like a 10%. It's not that bad to be in room one. But I was glad that I found out right. on the afternoon, not at 7, 10 in the morning. Yeah. That, that would have kind of set me off a little. It sounds, makes sense because it sounds too like you're mentally preparing yourself, right? Mentally, physically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how much sleep, mm-hmm. caffeine, not too much, food, everything. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if, if I'm going to be standing for four hours, maybe some compression socks. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> like a lot of, like, yes. like just complete attention to details. Yes. Um, and what I like in here is hearing the sensitivity of the yeah. five. Like there's a, a sensitivity, I think, both five and self-preservation to a lot of these little things. Like you're saying, it, it sounds minor, but it sounds like you're thinking through these things very carefully. And they matter. Yeah, extremely important. Yeah. 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 Um, and then just regarding the other subtypes, I really don't relate to social five or or sexual five much at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I think it's pretty clear that those other two are, are pretty mm-hmm. far away from, from what I am. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people... Tell me, like, oh, you're 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 a really good example of a self-preservation five. And, you know, that's getting a little old. 
<laughs> those like, people always want to tell you who you I'm like, are. I'm it's, like, okay, I, I get it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Enough I know, already. I already know that. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, I really don't, I don't relate to the other two very much at all. I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't, um, I'm really not intellectual, I would say. I don't, um, even though I went to school forever, so I don't relate to the intellect, the, uh, to that aspect of the social five. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't really relate to the sexual five that much, although I would have liked to have been, I, I, I admire that subtype more just because they're more emotional and creative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So now I'd like to hear from some of you the question we've been asking, uh, the sort of second round question, which is, um, what have you done to grow in light of the fact that you are a five and that you've been observing these type five patterns in you? And and maybe, too, anything you want to say about relationship, because I know Terry mentioned that, but we haven't gone too much into that, what relationships are like for you, especially if that's a growth area or a territory for working on it like it always is for all of us. Do you want to start, Richard? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow, you zinged will, will, will you start? <laughs> you, you zinged a new question at me. No prep. You need a little all, time? I was going to go through a subtype analysis <laughs> oh, okay, for yeah. you. Actually, actually I have if some we would, work I think, examples. I think we would of, like a subtype. Thank you for slowing us down. Oh, do you Thank, want that? Yes. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry okay. to switch it up on you again. Uh, but we would like to hear something more, because I know you mentioned you were a social subtype, but I'd love yeah. to hear hear more about that from, from you, you if you would. That's great. <laughs> um, so I see the subtypes in a, maybe a, a way you see them as I've kind of numerized them ones, two, and three. Um, the one is a self-pres. And for most of the five self-pres I know, they're able to go off by themselves, mm -hmm. like go on a hike or camping or something by themselves, which I really wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Um, the two would be the one-to-one -one or the sexual. And they can sit face-to-face -face with someone and just carry on this dialogue. And I've seen that at work where two people just go back and forth and they'll go for a half hour or something. And it's like, <laughs> what? How can, you know, I'm, I'd be dodging and how do I get out of here? <laughs> so that one-to-one -one is a comfort level between two people I love to see, but mm -hmm. I just am not that comfortable doing it. And so I, number three is the... Uh, the social, which is more than two, it's just a group sort of thing. And it's not that I strive to be in a group or go to cocktail parties or anything. It's like I understand and am comfortable in the group. So I can uh, say this is their role, this is what they're saying. I recognize easily who's doing what, where's the power, where's the dynamics. And it's a natural thing. I don't really strive to get into a group, but I do understand it and feel comfortable in a group. So. I think that's how I see the three differences. Right, right. And, and, and again, my approach is somewhat based on what you just said and also based on sort of what you talked about before about the character of the social five being a little bit more oriented toward knowledge um, and learning and, and then connecting with others through knowledge. Um, so, right. so, so I think I've, we've heard you say something about that before, like how important it is to be learning and knowing things and be the one who knows, more comfortable being an expert, you know, and being up in front of a group talking about that than some of the other fives. Yeah, and problem solving. Uh, my previous job in environmental engineering, I was called in to, to lead a group on um, water protection. So it was water type environmental stuff. And I initiated a consensus group because I really felt more comfortable thinking we could do this by consensus. We could develop a city ordinance, bringing in business people, bringing in lawyers for the environment, bringing in regulators, bringing in people that are really diverse and never agree on anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're all going to have the ability to say no. So when, when we came up with a provision for the ordinance, if someone in the group said no, we just threw it out. And everybody looked, that's never going to work. But uh, I was so comfortable because nobody was in a power structure. We were all equal, and we were trying for one goal, which we all saw. And it just worked out beautifully. We came up with a wonderful ordinance. We got a governor's award from the state for it. And it was like, 
suddenly I see the power of everybody having an equal say mm -hmm. where I, as a five, I'm just not interested in arguing with you. Mm -hmm. I see my point of view, you see yours, let's just agree that we have them and if we can come up with stuff we all agree with, it worked great. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's a social ability that a social subtype would have. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. Okay, thank you. So anyone want to speak to what, uh, what you've done to grow? Um, knowing, right. knowing you're a five, um, <laughs> how has that helped you understand yourself more and, and, and develop yourself? Well, I work on growing all the time. <laughs> Um, just because that's sort of who I am. Um, but I don't... <clears throat> I've had very little success moving toward seven if I don't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I can't wrap my mind around why I would want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, <laughs> there's so much work that I want to do, and I'm so purpose-driven that um, gatherings where I don't have a purpose feel like a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I really relate to what you just said about, um, you know, everybody has a point of view. One, one of my experiences about my own point of view is that I don't privilege it. I don't mm -hmm. see my point of view as in any way better than anybody else's mm -hmm. point of view. And so... Um, and also, when somebody else has a better idea of how to do something, I'm just fine with that. You know, just whatever moves the effort forward. But I, I just want to say this isn't about growth. I just relate so deeply to aspects of what each of you are saying about this. And it's so amazing. Uh, you know, perhaps you're the most different from me in many ways. But I deeply connect with how you describe yourself and, um, you know, and um, your, your seriousness and intensity of purpose about your work and wanting the conditions under which that works for you and, and not liking surprises. I intensely dislike surprises and wanting to be told a day before. Or, so even though we're perhaps among the most different fives on the panel. I deeply relate to the the way you describe yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you highlighted that because you can see some of the underlying things yeah. that yeah. are true for all fives, even if uh, the subtypes create some differences yeah. in presentation. Yeah. yeah. So anyone want to talk about what you've done to grow or how knowing, knowing that you're a five has helped? And it is true that I have heard from fives in the past uh, that it's been a little bit hard to really kind of take the growth path because it's sort of like, well, this coping strategy is really working for me. You know, it keeps me safe and I don't necessarily want to be around people and what's wrong with that and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, and at the same time, I think we've heard some things like Tracy was talking about sort of mix, mixing up the compartments and how that's scary. Um, so even maybe how, you know, I know it, it, it sounds like, if, especially in terms of wanting a lot of private space, maybe it would be good for us to hear something about relationship. Uh, and if, if relationship has been sort of a growth path or not, but how, how you navigate relationships given there is this part of you that wants to, that, you know, likes and appreciates a lot of time alone. So I think I'm going to incorporate the growth thing here. Okay, now that you've had a few minutes to think about it. Well, that's what. <laughs> so that's how I'm incorporating them. I'm Beautiful. not going to think about relationships. Okay. I'm just going to, because that's impossible. Preparation is key yes. for me. Okay. Yes. I'm not going to think about it and come up with. I'm just going to see if anything arises. Perfect. So I may be just passing this microphone too. But. I'm preparing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. You're I'm, so I'm on the growth path. Uh, we're growing as oh, we're speaking right. here. Always That's the beauty of it. Thank you. Um, I guess my last significant relationship, um, in relation to uh, the Enneagram, she thought she was a nine, and then she thought she was a four. 
And uh, we eventually broke up um, for various reasons. I won't get into that. But uh, I realized after I went to your subtype in Portland, the subtype workshop mm-hmm. you did, mm-hmm. I saw the self press 3, which was a foreign um, mm-hmm. thing. self press 3, kind of quiet, withdrawn 3, and mm-hmm. that's what she was. And I was so excited, and I called her. We'd been broken up for quite a while. I called her, and I found your subtype. And, cause we <laughs> talked about, and she was just cold, like, mm-hmm. we're done, you know, don't even... Mm-hmm. I thought, why are you being such a turd about this? You know? mm. <laughs> but she, she, I never did tell her. She wasn't even interested. Mm. I was like, but mm. I really do think, had I known she was a self pres three, our relationship would have been different. Because mm. I think they don't really recognize certain affections, and consequently, I didn't recognize that she was had these deep feelings for me, and. Uh, mm. And that's a problem, I think, maybe for fives, is seeing when that connection is deeper, at least for mm. a social. I don't, again, have that one-to-one sense. So it's always kind of like, are we close? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you love me? And, mm. <laughs> and unless it's kind of very clearly stated, it's not really always available to me, those those body interaction or body sort of signs and signals, that just is beyond me at mm-hmm. times. So mm-hmm. I do need to have a, an intellectual basis. And again, if I'd known her subtype and type, I think it would have made a lot of difference. Because mm-hmm. there would have been more understanding. It yeah, sounds suddenly. like that's part of what helps you with the Enneagram is having a little more of an understanding mentally of where they're coming from helps you orient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, suddenly it falls into place. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Anything, Tracy, you want to say about relationships uh, or growth either? Yeah, uh, my husband's an eight, a uh, self pres eight, and... Before I knew that, I felt that he was very controlling and uh, not very, not very um, sensitive. <laughs> and uh, so once I started learning um, about the Enneagram and about his type, my, our whole relationship changed. It was just, and it, he, uh, he calls this my numbers thing. So Your numbers thing? You mentioned something about the, the numbers. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, so he doesn't really... Uh, know much about it or but as I changed the way I received him he changed the way our our interaction just changed Mm -hmm. and um, we do still have this push-pull thing where I think my fear of him leaving or not accepting me or something I push him away just to protect myself and then he's got kind of this push thing as well Mm -hmm. Um, but we've been able to kind of create a dance around that a little bit. And um, so I know more now that he's acting out of protection, wanting to protect me versus mm. wanting to control me. Mm. At least that's the way I'm <laughs> that's interpreting the way you've it. That it. makes it easier for me. Yeah, I bet. Um, and then the other thing I want to say about, uh, well, and and that I think goes along with other relationships too, my my push people away, pull them back in, push them away to test them, pull them back in. I really recognize that about myself and have actually had some really good conversations with people, sharing that with them, saying, or friends of mine, that this is what I'm doing. I know, I recognize that I'm doing Mm. this. When you feel me pulling away, don't let me go. Hang, Hang on to me in some way. And it's really made a difference mm. for me. And it, it um, you know, the more I feel that, the more uh, safe I feel in, in letting that go mm-hmm. and not having to test so often. Yeah. 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 And then just one other uh, quick thing that um, I wanted to say about, um, I guess it kind of goes in that gro- in the growth category of, I'm very much an introvert, and I, I don't know if that's typical a typical five trait. And uh, when I say that to, and I'm and I every bone in my body is an introvert. And when I say that to people, or we have a conversation about that, they're surprised that I feel so strongly about that um, because they feel that mm-hmm. I'm 
extroverted, and I and I think that it's sort of what you were saying. I'm uh, exhibiting other people's behavior that I see. You know, they're at a party and they're having fun and they're, you know, dancing around or something. And I'm like, oh, I, I guess I can try that um, just to kind of be part of the part of the group. So sometimes I appear to be very extroverted, but it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And as my friend said, it's a little bit of a camouflage. So they, someone doesn't pull her out or push her. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's interesting. I do find that sometimes the self-preservation five feels like the warmest five. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that to the sense that um, this paradox that sometimes when we have more confidence in our boundaries, we can actually be more open Mm -hmm. to a certain degree Mm -hmm. at a certain level, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I do find that sometimes self-preservation fives get experienced by others as warm or sensitive in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. And the, just one, I'm sorry, one more thing of um, the, the energy, holding onto my energy and being protective of how much energy I expend. It's, I, it's a calculation um, for me in my head. And, but I have found that, and I think the last workshop that I was at, I was kind of really challenged about that, is trying to go beyond what my, when my tank is empty, mm. keep going. And as mm. I've, it's almost like practicing those things, then I feel, I feel more confident that, oh, this is really just in my head. I do have, I could go another day. Uh, you right. know, on this empty tank because I got so much more to say yes. and do. That's a really right. important yeah. point. Sometimes it's fives need to learn on the growth path that 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 sense of scarcity is really an illusion, mm-hmm. that there is more energy and more nourishment for you, and yet the, the, the mental model of scarcity sometimes is limiting in itself. And so, like you're mm-hmm. saying, breaking out of that experience to recognize, that, oh, that's just just an idea I have. It's not necessarily real. Yeah. Okay. Terry, anything you want to say about how, how knowing your five has helped you understand yourself or grow? Um, sure. Um, so yeah, a lot of my attention or energy is about relationships and intimacy and all of that. Um, I'm not one of those sort of satisfied fives who, yeah, I spend a lot of time alone, but I don't, I don't really enjoy spending a lot of time alone, um, or the, you know, the lack of intimacy. It's, Mm -hmm. I'm not really okay with, with just being that way. So you're a little more in touch with the pain of that, connected Uh, to that pattern. Would you say that or the discomfort? More discomfort. I mean, Mm -hmm. pain sounds a little bit more... Um, almost more like a feeling, which mm. that might be. A, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, no. Just to be honest. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I, yeah. I would really like to experience feelings more, but mm-hmm. just to be truthful, I don't know if I'd call it pain, discomfort, mm-hmm. or anxiety. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, a, a pretty early on during these past five years with the workshops with, that I've attended with Beatrice, as well as some of her workshops, um, and some of the other things I was doing with therapy, the, um, I got sort of this feedback a couple of, two or three or four different times that was sort of consistent, which was that, um, um, that there was a, uh, Um, something about the way I can just being timid and inhibited, like really the, or the way I am in my body, that that was very important and something that maybe that that was a way I could, I could work on myself. Um, And so I was doing, you know, I started with yoga, which was good for uh, like just relaxation or or breathing um, or breathing with movement, uh, things like that. And so the, the, feedback I got a couple of different from a few different people was that maybe something um, involving sort of like aggression or healthy aggression or something more relational would be would be good or I could I should try it and so it's that made sense and then I had a session with somebody who um, 
you know, I guess you'd call her a psychic. And she, so she didn't know a lot about my biography, but she was kind of reading into me and, and just trying to tell me what she thought I needed to know. And she really, um, we ended up talking about this whole thing about um, just the the way I, I'm very inhibited in my body and, you know, in the context of with other people where I almost, where I literally kind of with, withdraw, or like literally move back, even just, even if it's subtle, when I'm, when somebody comes towards me or, or something like that. And, and that maybe it, it went back to a, a very long time ago where I was, I was kind of maybe roughed up by other boys and I, and, or, just didn't do very well with with contact or or fighting or um, roughness and and she thought well maybe you could start doing something where you're you kind of get out there and you experience the roughness of other men um, but and you just kind of keep practicing that and and just see what happens and so I started doing Aikido which I've been doing for two and a half years now and that's yeah. been it's been really hard I mean it's it's to I mean, for me, it's been extremely difficult because at this point after, you know, four and a half decades, just to be so hardwired to be a certain way in your body and not just your body, but just your, your nervous system, your neuroregulation. Um, and it turns out that this is like the thing that is it with the patterns I have. It is it's just I have to work through all of that. Mm -hmm. um, like I don't. It's almost like I have like nothing going for me naturally to help me do this thing, which is just considered mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. Period. Right. Um, and it's been. So I've learned a lot. It's been very interesting, I guess, to to see what's happened, and you know the feedback I get from sensei. You know, throughout class, it'll just be like a few words. It is. It's pretty interesting because what he says. It's things that are happening to me all the time, not just at the mm. dojo, but literally like every minute, every moment, mm. just throughout the day, every day. Um, so I'll just give you some examples of, of the feedback. He'll, it'll be something like, um, uh, don't, don't collapse your body, or you're too stiff, or um, stand your ground, mm. don't flinch. Um, you, you need to find your center. Mm. Um, you know, you, so it, and it's just beautiful. It's literally like every single thing he's ever said has been something that I knew or kind of already knew mm. that I do this. This happens to me in my body, in my nervous mm. system, like all the time. Mm. Um, and so I don't know. It's, my progress is in, it, in it has been so slow that I don't. I mean, I'm I'm willing. I want to keep trying, but it's it's definitely been um, one way to kind of learn about myself. Uh, I don't know. The last it's for a while now. I've been kind of. I don't know, experiencing some uh, sort of like resignation or kind mm -hmm. of like giving up mm -hmm. with regards to a lot of like the, the, the things I've been trying and. Um, I mean, it's all been good. I don't regret any of the workshops I've done or any of the things I've tried. But it's, you know, it's it's been it's been hard. It's not easy, and I think yeah. especially for us self preses sometimes it's harder to change. There's like a there's something deep inside that's about conservation and saving or protecting ourselves, and it can be hard to break out of some of the old patterns. Yeah. Yeah, but um. But yeah, going back to that session I had where I got this idea to do, mm. to try martial arts, um, it wasn't, it, this is more of an intellectual thing, but it was, um, it kind of gave me a different, a deeper understanding of, of the passion of avarice. Because initially it, it just, mm. I related to it, okay, yeah, time, energy, you know, things like that. That was all really obvious that I was very um, protective of or not, not generous with. Mm. Um, but when she started talking more about this, the way I, I was sort of timid in my, and inhibited in my body, it, I guess the understanding I had was that it was really more about not giving myself, like 
not just things that are more concrete, like time or energy or money, but yes. like actually my actual self, withholding my, yourself, my, yes. my actual body, my right. uh, whatever I have to give, just literally, just just kind of uh, keeping it in yes. and, and and like physically kind of withdrawing. That's a beautiful description of avarice, I think, which is the passion of type five. So it's a holding back and a holding in. It's not like greed, like we normally think about it just for money. It's it's energetically holding oneself back and holding energy and resources. So I think that's a perfect place to stop. Um, and I want to open it up to questions, but before that, I'll just take one minute just to talk about the movements between eight and seven, because we've talked about those for most of the types. So five is connected to eight and seven. And as I've said before, uh, we believe that it's important to go against the arrow first. Uh, it's sometimes what had to be given up in childhood, or it's just a more secure place. So five goes to eight against the arrow. Uh, which is often, we heard a little bit about uh, this, especially from Michael. Uh, it's a little bit about getting more into the body, and I think this is exactly what Terry was just mentioning. Um, uh, my teaching partner, Ronio, sometimes says, you know, us fives, it's like we're just ahead. Uh, and we, it's like, what's this body? It's just a vehicle for keeping, to, for carrying around the head. Uh, and so getting into eight can be getting into their body, being more physical, uh, cre creating, having healthy anger to create boundaries and to ground oneself. So much of what you just said and that you're learning in this martial art is, is a perfect example of going to eight in a good way. Holding your ground, uh, being more in your strength and your power, uh, sh sharing, exhibiting that in the world when appropriate. Um, and then moving to seven, which is this sometimes called the stress move. For us, it's re the real direction of spiritual growth, but only where you should go after you've integrated uh, the arrow against uh, uh, because it gives you more inner stability. Going to seven, uh, for fives tend to go very deeply into their intellectual interests. Sevens uh, are a little bit more, they, they're more interested in more little thi more things, but they go into them at a, at not as deeply. Uh, so getting interested in a wider range of things, getting out into the world more with your ideas, um, sharing them with others, uh, being more social and more engaged in sharing ideas with a lot of other people and tasting a lot of different things uh, as a way of bringing yourself outside of yourself uh, uh, more, being more expressive in the external world uh, as sevens can be. So now I'd like to open it up for questions for our fives. <clears throat> yeah, Terry. I have a question for the self five. Mm -hmm. Where is the safe place? Where, is your, where do you restore your energy um, mm -hmm. um, for self press fives? It, gosh, there's all kinds of places. There's all kinds of places to go hide. <laughs> uh, Can you give us some of them? Yeah. Or, or will you be uh, disclosing secret information? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, an example that um, my husband and I, uh, when we get home from work, I've already described to him what it's like for me being at work all day and being engaged all day long, and I just want to come home and decompress. And so even if we enter the house at the same time, we kind of go to our separate corners and we do, you know, I have a little ritual of, you know, washing my face and putting my comfy clothes on, and he goes outside and walks around the yard. And, uh, and so then, you know, 30 minutes later, we can come together and we're, we're great and can engage. And so... I think for me, planning those kind of things out, um, uh, even arriving here today, arriving early, so I have time to kind of um, sit and think about, um, you know, how, how this is going to go, and um, so those kind of things. I think uh, reading is a really, you know, I've probably got five or six books going at one time, and just depending on what the release for me is, um, I choose the book accordingly. Sometimes you hear five say they have a special room in their house that they go to be alone. Sometimes self-pressed five say their house 
period, is yeah. their sanctuary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know two fives who actually designed their own house, you know, or designed a big addition to the house. And so the physical structure and the, the, the barrier around that can be very important. My friend is the one who wrote the piece in, my, in the complete Enneagram. I have for each of the subtypes, I have someone writing something who's actually that type. And she talks about how when she moved into her house, her next door neighbor came over and welcomed her, but invited her to be in a book club with her. And she said that idea sounded like the absolute worst idea she'd ever heard in her life. She said it was as if the woman asked her to run away and join the circus with her. It was that distasteful. Like, why would I want to be in a book club with the person who's right next door to me? Like, she's hoping that person never knocks on her door again. Um, she doesn't want to go to she doesn't want to go to block parties. So there's this sense of like my home, my private space is is to is very precious and she said she likes nothing more than being at home by herself at home just at home but, but with and again if someone drops by unannounced that's that feels intrusive uh, because there is this sense of, of safety and security that you can have at home anything you want to say about about an answer to that question where do you go where do you like to be alone what um, I mean I, I guess the short answer is home mm-hmm. but it's I mean, it's it's something that it's like the opposite of doing Aikido. This is like automatic. Like I don't have. To, I've never ever had to try to do that because I do that automatically. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I have. I guess one of the insights I had when I about being a five was that I have too much security and protection and time alone and. I have like a massive surplus of all of that. Uh, And so I don't, I've never, I never think about this question because I'm kind of trying to move away from it really Mm -hmm. rather than just. Yeah, it's it's happening all the time for you. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Um, Yeah. May I still ask Terry, did I hear correctly that you were working in a cubicle? Uh, no, I'm uh, uh, about th- three days a week. I work in a clinic, yeah. and so if I'm not in an exam room, and I, I have to work on the computer. It's at a, a little cubicle. Yeah. I, that doesn't feel comfortable, uh, you know, when you want to have your own space. If that was the case, doesn't how are you with a cubicle? Way? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd rather have my own, but yeah. it's not up to me. Yeah. But yeah, like, <laughs> but like I said, I mean, I gave you one example of, yeah. of um, okay. distraction from another from a colleague. So yeah, of course, mm-hmm. I'd rather have my own. Mm-hmm. Other questions for our fives? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you fives, especially the self pres identified as self pres fives, have any suggestions for those of us in relationship? with fives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I've got a, several important fives in my life. Great. And, um, and it, yeah, it might be good to hear from all of you about the suggestions for five. For uh, other than don't take anything personally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning that one. <laughs> yeah, I think my, my example with my husband and m- making agreements and just um, checking it out, I think... For me, if somebody asks me a question about how I'm feeling or what I'm doing, I'm very happy to share it. Uh, but I don't want that to be assumed. So maybe, hmm. maybe finding out what what you can do or you know how you can interact in a way that is comfortable. So checking things out, yeah. maybe asking, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Any other tips for people who are in relationship with fives? In that last uh, workshop you had with the fours, type fours talked about the backstory and how they naturally come up with some wonderful stories. And I've seen that. It's really amazing. And so I have those backstories, but they don't come out. They don't flow like they do with the four. And so the questioning is really helpful. If you can 
I do have stuff in here, but it's not going to volunteer itself. So <laughs> if you have questions and kind of lead it out, if you're really, because I'm always thinking, are you really interested or is this just mm. small talk? And right. if there's no interest, why am I doing this? But if there really is and you're questioning, then sometimes things just bubble out that are maybe helpful. I don't know. But, right. uh, That's a really good one. Yeah, the, the, you may doubt if we're interested. And so right. one thing we can do is ask questions. Uh, but again, I would assume also make it okay to say no if you don't want to share, right? Is that? Well, again, I've got, uh, I've found that I have a lot of free time too by myself mm -hmm. that I, I have time to share. So, mm -hmm. that's so, not so you're a, not mostly willing to share, but if yeah. people ask questions, that helps you know that yeah. they're interested and it helps, bring, helps you bring it out. Right. If I recognize there's an authentic interest, mm -hmm. then uh, sharing is open. It's an open channel. It's just yeah. not something I'm able to throw out the backstory in a beautiful, Sometimes you graceful do, it way. Sometimes it does come but, out. Uh, the information's in there. It's just That's great. Thank you. Anyone else? Tips uh, for getting along with fives? Yeah, um, my wife, Cheryl, uh, may be Enneagram 4. She mm -hmm. hasn't studied it yet, but um, I've, I've read the description to her, and um, so she's thinking about it. Um, and so being married for 35 years, a, a five, social five on I think probably a social four. Um, you know, the four along with the two most need love and affection. Mm. And the five is the most isolated point on the Enneagram. So once I understood that, and once Cheryl at least thought that maybe she was a four, not having studied it, we were able to kind of laugh about it, mm -hmm. you know. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, here we are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but because the one-to-one -one five has more access to emotions than the other five types, and because I really need love and, um, and, and need to love, um, uh, there's a lot of space where we can really meet there. Um, and then in terms of going to seven, I, I would almost ask you this, Beatrice. Um, I'm really fine uh, in, in, in interaction with people at Commonweal, it's constant, because I have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And then I'm fine with it. And, mm -hmm. um, and moreover, in a work setting, you don't you use time economically. Mm -hmm. So nobody's kind of hanging on to me for an endless purpose <laughs> discussion. You know, it's like we're we're doing something and we'll take as long as it needs, mm -hmm. and maybe it'll take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But when it's done, it's done and we move on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, and and I also need the boundary at the end of the day, whenever that is. I need to stop, you know, and I need to go into my routines of mm -hmm. self-renewal and, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm, I'm comfortable in relationships mm -hmm. as some combination of a sexual and social. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to add, uh, just in that what I described as a conversation about um, what the need is, I think it would be important for me to be prepared for that. So mm -hmm. if the conversation was gonna be had, I wouldn't want it to be just a spontaneous thing, then I feel like I would probably be suspicious that why are you asking me these things? But if it was prefaced by, I really wanna understand how I, we can have a more meaningful, deep, deeper relationship, and then it, it would feel more authentic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else you wanna to add to that, Terry? No. Okay. Right. Okay. Hey, yeah, question. I was noticing a kind of interesting paradox, and maybe someone has a comment, that this is the most withdrawn type that wouldn't normally probably just want to sit in front of a room and talk about themselves, but what you're talking about is information and important data, and it seems like that's what's what's got you here, and I'm just wondering, is 
Does that sound right? Or not right? I think like some, sharing the knowledge. Yeah, I think sometimes what's easier to share is the knowledge and the information, which is part of what's happening now. It's a little bit harder to share the personal stuff, mm-hmm. you know? Like you're saying, with its purpose, then it makes sense. But is that considered going to seven? In other words, if I go to seven with purpose, am I actually going to seven, or do I have to figure out how to go to cocktail parties? <laughs> I, think it's, I think the growing edge is always sharing more about yourself and not just the purpose or the task. Yeah. Okay, one more question, yep. So I'm curious because the fives are withdrawn and relationships for some of you seem to be a little bit more challenging. What, I'm curious, Michael, how you've made your marriage last for so many years if you need so much alone time and so much withdrawing time to have that togetherness, to have that relationship last so long? Well, that's a great question. You might want to ask Charles too. But uh, <laughs> what I would say is... Um, when Shaw was growing up in a small town in Colorado where there were no Jews, uh, she decided at some point that she didn't want to marry the captain of the football team. She wanted to marry uh, a Jewish or half-Jewish guy from the East Coast. And <laughs> when I was in my first marriage, I had this strange feeling that I was supposed to be with a blonde woman from a small town in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I have... My basic theories about relationship are first that it it first that it leave love aside, it helps to like each other. And the second one is that both people have to have a fierce dedication to making it work. Mm-hmm. And the third thing is that you will figure out how you drive each other crazy and the relationship will depend on what, how, how you deal with that. Mm-hmm. And the fourth and final thing is that it helps to have something bigger than both of you. Uh, that holds you together. And I mean, from the time we got together, we knew that we were in this for life, that we were fiercely dedicated to it. And we do actually like each other as well as love each other. We know how we drive each other crazy, and we've figured out ways around it, which are basically not to talk about it. That's (laughs) how it goes. And we both have a passionate commitment to doing work that helps people in the world. And so, um, actually, um, it's a pretty wonderful relationship a lot of the time. And I think in a 35-year marriage, you actually go through five or seven different marriages. um, And each one is a a new new adventure. All right. I think we have to leave it there because we are out of time. But um, and now we'll take. All right. Oh yeah, we have. Let's have one more from the the woman in question. (laughs) Should we? Can you can you pass this back to her? Oh, thank you. Start 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 over. Yeah. We have. through the years, we find each other incredibly interesting because we are so different. I mean, we look at each other and say, that is the most interesting thing I've seen anybody ever do. Why would he want to do that? That is really something. And, and just kind of appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And I found dealing with this five, the best way to relate to it when I really need something is not to talk about it, but to come in at an angle. Come in some kind of an angle, rather than sit down and rationalize on this and this and share information. But just, okay, we need some real serious hugs here. Mm -hmm. Let's just come in with some pure physicality or Mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Or something that will surprise him in a way that doesn't scare him. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, he, I'm the kind of person, if somebody said to me, let's run off to the circus tomorrow, I'd say, okay, I'll go pack my bags. This is fine. (laughs) (laughs) And Michael's the kind of person who says, well, what time are you going to bed? I need to know what time we're going to bed tonight. (laughs) What? (laughs) Why would you want to know that? You know, he wants to sketch out, he wants to know what's happening. And I'm the one who's, oh, there's a big surprise out there. We just op- open the door and there's a hawk right on the apple tree. He's never been there before. Michael, you see it. I mean, just, you know, find out where the gentle surprises are and find a way to share that. Mm-hmm. I don't sounds, know if I'm a foreigner. Sounds like yet, appreciate but that the difference. kind of sound like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 But don't you think that's true, Michael? Yes. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> Avoiding conversation with a very intellectual five to, to nail things down is a very useful thing. Just avoid it. Find a way to sneak in and yeah. find the joy. Great tips. I'm taking those myself for my five friend. All right. Thank you so much, panelists. We really